welcome to Literary Lutheran Reads the Book of Concord. This is the episode for Thursday, where we continue to go through the Lord's, the Lord's Supper or the Sacrament of the Altar. So you see, it is not left free in the sense that we may despise it. I call that despising the sacrament if one allows a long time to elapse, with nothing to hinder him, yet never feels a desire for it. If you want such freedom, you may just as well have the freedom to not be a Christian and not to and not have to believe or pray. One is just as much commanded by Christ as the other. But if you want to be a Christian, you must from time to time fulfill and obey this commandment. For this commandment ought always to move you to examine yourself. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And to think, see, what sort of Christian I am? If I were one, I would certainly have some small longing for what my Lord has commanded me to do. Since we act like strangers toward the sacrament, it is easy to see what sort of Christians we were under the papacy. We went at the sacrament for mere compulsion and fear of human commandments, without natural longing and without love, and never thought about Christ's commandment. But we neither force nor compel anyone, nor does anyone have to do it to serve or please us. This should lead and constrain you by itself, that the Lord desires it and that it is pleasing to him. You must not let people force you to faith or any good work. We are doing no more than talking about and encouraging you about what you ought to do, not for our sake, but for your own sake. The Lord invites and allures you. If you despise it, you must answer for that yourself. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Now this is to be the first point, especially for those who are cold and indifferent. Then they may reflect upon it and rouse themselves. For this is certainly true, as I have found in my own experience, and as every one will find in his own case. If a person withdraws like this from the sacrament, he will daily become more and more callous and cold, and will at last disregard the sacrament completely. To avoid this, we must examine our heart and conscience, 1 Corinthians 11.28, 2 Corinthians 13.5, and we must act like people who desire to be right with God, Psalm 78.37. The more this is done, the more the heart will be warmed and enkindled so it may not become entirely cold. But if you say, how can I come if I feel that I am not prepared? Answer, that is also my cause for hesitation, especially because of the old way under the Pope. At that time, we tortured ourselves to be so perfectly pure that God could not find the least blemish in us. For this reason, we became so timid that we were all instantly thrown into fear and said to ourselves, Alas, we are unworthy. Then nature and reason begin to add up our unworthiness in comparison with the great and precious good. Then our good looks like a dark lantern in contrast with the bright sun, or like filth in comparison with precious stones. Because nature and reason see this, they refuse to approach and wait until they are prepared. They wait so long that one week trails into another, and half the year into the other. If you consider how good and pure you are and labor to have no hesitations, you would never approach. Therefore, we must make a distinction here between people. Those who are lewd and morally loose must be told to stay away, 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13. They are not prepared to receive forgiveness of sin since they do not desire it and do not wish to be godly. But the others who are not such callous and wicked people and who desire to be godly must not absent themselves. This is true even though otherwise they are feeble and full of infirmities. For St. Hilary also is said, If anyone has not committed sin for which he can rightly be put out of the congregation and be considered no Christian, he ought not to stay away from the sacrament lest he should deprive himself of life. No one will live so well that he will not have many daily weaknesses in flesh and blood. Such people must learn that it is the highest art to know that our sacrament does not depend upon our worthiness. We are not baptized because we are worthy and holy, nor do we go to confession because we are pure and without sin. On the contrary, we go because we are poor, miserable people. We go exactly because we are unworthy. This is true unless we are talking about someone who desires no grace and absolution, nor intends to change. But whoever would gladly receive grace and comfort should drive himself and allow no one to frighten him away. Say, I indeed would like to be worthy, but I come not upon any worthiness, but upon your word, because you have commanded it. I come as one who would gladly be your disciple, no matter what becomes of my worthiness. This is difficult. 
we always have this obstacle and hindrance to encounter. We look more upon ourselves than upon Christ's word and lips. For human nature desires to act in such a way that it can stand and rest firmly on itself. Otherwise, it refuses to approach. Let this be enough about the first point. In the second place, there is besides this command also a promise, as we heard above. This ought most strongly to stir us up and encourage us. For here stand the kind and precious words. This is my body, which is given for you. This is my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words, I have said, are not preached to wood and stone, but to me and you. Otherwise, Christ might just as well be silent and not institute a sacrament. Therefore, consider and read yourself into this word, you, so that he may not speak to you in vain. Here he offers to us the entire treasure that he has brought for us from heaven. With the greatest kindness, he invites us to receive it also in other places, like when he says in St. Matthew 11:28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is surely a sin and a shame that he so cordially and faithfully summons and encourages us to receive our highest and greatest good, yet we act so distantly toward it. We permit so long a time to pass without partaking of the sacrament that we grow quite cold and hardened, so that we have no longer no longing or love for it. We must never think of the sacrament as something harmful from which we had better flee, but as a pure, wholesome, comforting remedy that grants salvation and comfort. It will cure you and give you life both in soul and body. For where the soul has recovered, the body also is relieved. Why then do we act as if the sacrament were a poison, the eating of which would bring death? To be sure, it is true that those who despise the sacrament and live in an unchristian way, to, way receive it to their hurt and damnation. 1 Corinthians 11, 29-30 Nothing shall be good or wholesome for them. It is just like a sick person who on a whim eats and drinks what is forbidden to him by the doctor. But those who are mindful of their weakness desire to be rid of it and long and long for help. They should regard and use the sacrament just like a precious antidote against the poison that they have in them. Here in the sacrament you are to receive from the lips of Christ forgiveness of sin. It contains and brings with it God's grace and the Spirit with all his gifts, protection, shelter, and power against death and the devil and all misfortune. So you have from God both the command and the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides this, from yourself, you have your own distress, which is around your neck. Because of your distress, this command, invitation, and promise are given. This ought to move you. For Christ himself says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Matthew 9, 12. In other words, he means those who are weary and heavy laden with their sins, with the fear of death, temptations of the flesh, and of the devil. If, therefore, you are heavy laden and feel your weakness, then go joyfully to the sacrament and receive refreshment, comfort, and strength. Matthew 11:28. If you wait until you are rid of such burdens so that you might come to the sacrament pure and worthy, you must stay away forever. In that case, Christ pronounce, pronounces sentence and says, If you are pure and godly, you have no need of me, and I, in turn, no need of you. Therefore, the only people who are called unworthy are those who neither feel their weakness nor wish to be considered sinners. This is a literary Lutheran wishing you a blessed day.